Well, I, you know, there, every now and then you hear a song and it catches you off guard and, I, and you think that that song speaks to me. And that was the case for me, just listening to that song, Living Waters. I had not heard it before. Actually, I did hear it before the service. I heard them in rehearsal and God was speaking to me through it. I know I'm going to be singing that throughout this week. So thank you to our worship team for uh, leading us with that song. Let's pray and ask God, the Lord of Living Waters, to speak to us through his living word. Father, it's one thing to sing those things. It's another thing to know them in our hearts. And thank you that we can know that our hope is secure, that you are the Lord of living water. You offer us fresh, flowing, living water for our soul. Uh, we ask that you'd help us now to drink deeply of the water of your word, that you would speak to us. We pray in your name. Amen. So a number of years ago, this, this happens from time to time. I will be talking to somebody after a service or they'll reach out to me and want to talk to me about something they heard in the sermon. I always appreciate interaction. I think every preacher does about how God's using their sermons. But every now and then somebody will say they disagree. Uh, and often it's because I wasn't clear or I said something foolish, which happens more often than you might think. Maybe, you, maybe you're not surprised by that. I know that my family's not. And this woman reached out to me and wanted to meet. She said she had some, some issues and some disagreements. Uh, and we met to talk about that. And as we talked, I realized, I thought maybe she was going to tell me that I, I misspoke or I said something dumb. But I realized she was talking about the very thing the Bible was teaching. Like the main point of the sermon she completely disagreed with. So we, I was trying to be gentle about this. We went back and forth, and, and, and finally I was pointing her in the direction of a couple of scriptures that would challenge her thinking that we referenced in the sermon. And she said these words, yeah, I know about that. I just don't agree. I just don't think that's right. She said, I know what the Bible says. I just don't think that's right. Caught me in my tracks. But at least she was honest about it. At least that person, she had the, the clarity and honesty of her, of her mind and heart to say what she really thought. Because quite frankly, that is the rub. That's one of the great challenges that confronts all of us who try to follow Jesus faithfully. When you find yourself disagreeing with God and his word, and it happens to me, it happens to you, who do you assume is right? When I disagree with my wife, I think we'd be, have a much better marriage if I assumed she was right. Because you know what? She almost always is. But I don't assume that. I assume that I'm right. But when it comes to the word of God, I think we do the same thing. And if we want to follow him in, in our day, in our time, I think we need to be equipped to bring our thinking and our sensibilities and our understanding of the world under the authority and the light of his word. The Bereans were commended for this in Acts 17. Paul says they're of more noble character because they heard Paul explain the gospel and they were thrilled by it, but they went home to check the scriptures every night to see if it was true. I'm convinced that this is something we must be equipped to do. Not check Snopes, not ch check Wikipedia or, or Facebook or your friend's opinions, but come to the Word of God and say, is this right? Is this true? And we've been trying to do that in this series called Did God Say That? Looking at phrases and sayings that we hear and even that we use from time to time, but wondering, are these accurate? Are these right? Did God really say that according to his word? And so let's do that with our phrase for this week. It's the phrase, love the sinner, hate the sin. Love the sinner, hate the sin. Perhaps you've used this phrase. Perhaps you've heard this phrase. Uh, I, I have uh, both. And I don't know what comes in your mind when you think about it. I asked, I did a little sort of um, anecdotal research this week as I was talking to people, even in my own family. I asked my daughter, what, is, what, what do you think of when you hear this phrase? And she said, Hamilton the musical. <laughs> I was shocked. Hamilton? She said, yeah, Dad. It's actually in one of the lyrics uh, in one of the songs. I guess it's the song in the room where it happens. I had no idea that this phrase was in Hamilton, but it is. Uh, and it's often used in different ways by different kinds of people. Most of us have heard this phrase, and it's most often used as an attempt to sort of separate the person from the action that they're doing, the sinner from the sin, so to speak. Came across this cartoon from Calvin Hobbes, which I think Calvin Hobbes is great social commentary. It's timeless, but this one really makes me laugh <laughs> because his father comes home and <laughs> he's got the sign in the yard, love the sinner, hate the sin. Uh-oh, what does that mean? Most of us have heard this phrase or are familiar with it in some way. And I did a little more research online and talking with people, and, and, and I think it's fair to say that for most, not all, but for most people who follow Jesus, most Christians who hear this phrase have a generally positive reaction to it. We're saying, what you're doing I may not agree with, but I want to love you anyway. However, I think it's also fair to say that for most people who are not Christians, who don't identify as Christ followers, when they hear this phrase, 
they feel the opposite. They have a negative reaction. They don't feel loved. We'll get to that in a minute. Two different groups hearing the same words, but interpreting it very differently. Okay, but let's ask the question, the very key question, is it biblical? Is it biblical to say, love the sinner, hate the sin? Well, it sure sounds biblical, doesn't it? I mean, it sounds Bible-y. It's got the word sin in it. That's a good start. Uh, like maybe something Jesus might say. Actually, Jesus never said this. The Apostle Paul never said this. In fact, this phrase does not appear anywhere in the Bible. So where does it come from? Where did we get it? Well, St. Augustine, in a letter to a group of nuns, encouraged them to continue loving each other and hating their sin. Some have attributed the, the, the genesis of the phrase to him. I don't think so. More commonly, it's attributed to Mahatma Gandhi, who said something very similar. He said that we should hate the sin and not the sinner. However, I want to read to you the rest of this quote, which you see only a portion here. Hate the sin and not the sinner is a precept which, though easy enough to understand, is rarely practiced. And this is why the poison of hatred spreads so rapidly in our world. Hmm. Okay, so the phrase is not in the Bible, but maybe the idea, the concept is biblical. Is the idea of love the, sin, love the sinner and hate the sin, is that biblical? Well, let's ask the question about God. Does God hate? Doesn't the Bible say that God is love? Does God hate sin? Absolutely he does. We'll read from a, a couple of selected sections here. The book of Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. These things are an abomination that God hates. Clearly, God hates and despises sin and evil in the world. Psalm 5, verse 5. If I can find it. Verses 4 and 5. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. Whoa. Whoa. Okay, one of the challenges with this phrase, and when we hear these scriptures, is that it completely separates the person from the sin. And I understand the, the impulse to want to do that, but it's not as if sin is totally outside of you or me. I'd like it to be, oh, that's just something I did or something I said or something I thought. It's not actually me. But the Bible doesn't see it that way. Psalm 51, 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Paul says in Romans 10, No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they've become wicked and worthless. No one does good, not even one. So when the Bible uses the phrase sinner, we tend to think of somebody who sins. But that's not primarily what the Scripture means. When the Bible uses the phrase sinner, it doesn't just mean someone who commits a sin, because we all do. It's talking about something else a little different. 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, gives us an indication of what the Bible's really talking about here. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning and also practices lawlessness, sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away all sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. John, in this letter here, is getting at something important. The Bible's definition of sinner is somebody who willfully, continually, unrepentantly goes on with their own way, rejecting God, even when they know the truth. It doesn't mean somebody who screws up or makes a mistake or has a, an area of struggle they're trying to get a handle on that's really damaging to them or others. It means someone who just says, I don't care, I'm doing my thing. I don't care who it hurts. I think one of the other barriers I have that we have is we don't really understand how big a deal sin is, how serious it is. And so when we hear phrases about God hating evildoers and hating all wickedness and sin, it feels like extreme, like, you know, relax, God. I know people aren't perfect, but you made us, and I mean, take it easy. But sin's a big deal. It's serious business. I remember when my son, Benjamin, was a little guy 
we're in our front yard playing ball, and uh, he's messing around. When we're, 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 my older two are riding their bikes in the driveway, and the ball or a toy, I forgot what it was, was rolling toward the street. And all I know is a dad, I was further up the driveway, and I turned out of the corner of my eye, and I saw him toddling toward the, the street. And we live on a, not a busy road, but it's not a quiet street either. It's kind of a through street, and I could see cars turning at the stop sign four houses down. And I panicked. You know that, that parent panic you have? I panicked. He's going to walk in the street. I could see the tragedy happening before my eyes. And I screamed, Benjamin, stop! And little two-and-a-half-year-old Ben just froze, froze, because he heard his dad's voice. Froze. Turned around, looked at me with wide eyes, started to cry. He thought he was in trouble. I walked over to him, and I got down right at his face level, and I said, you cannot ever go in the street, ever, ever, ever go in there without me with you. Okay, Daddy, okay. Why did I, why did I yell at him like that? Because I know how deadly and dangerous it was for him. A couple more steps could have been over. That's not an overdramatization of how the Bible talks about sin. It destroys families. It corrupts hearts. It causes oppression and injustice in the world. It tears apart marriages. It damages our minds and our behaviors. It's wreaking havoc all over the world. And God hates it. And Jesus went to the cross for sinners, not just for sins. He didn't die for your sin. He died for you and for me. He took our place. Romans 5, 8. One of the simplest statements of the glory of the gospel as it relates to this phrase. But God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not once we cleaned up our act and got our sin under control, managed it, and came presentable to God, then he died for us. He died for you because he loves you while you were still in sin. Okay, so we see that God does hate sin and God does love sinners. But what about us? Is this phrase something we should say? Is it, I mean, this is maybe we can apply it to God, but is it applied to us? We should live by, uh, in relationship to other people. Christopher Yuan wrote, this phrase is something we are better off doing and not saying. Think about it for a minute. If I say, you know, I love you, but I hate your sin. I love you, sinner, but I hate your sin. It's not like sinner is a term of endearment. I'm not going to call somebody else a sinner, right? I mean, you know, oh, look, there's my favorite little sinner. Come here, sinner. We don't, that's not a phrase you use. People don't feel complimented by that or, or appreciated or liked even. I'm loving you even though you're doing terrible things that I hate. I think for us it's something we should do and not say. And actually, Jesus said, love your neighbor. And Paul said, hate your own sin. And the New Testament story that gets at this most beautifully is a story from the Gospel of John. So I think the question we have to ask as we come to the story, is it helpful? We ask, is it biblical, but is it helpful to say or think this way? And I think the story that illustrates this so beautifully is out of the Gospel of John, chapter 8. I'm going to read, uh, starting in, in chapter 7, verse 53, for us, through 8, verse 11. They went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more, he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And when Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him, Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Such an incredible story. I, I hope we can do it justice in the few moments we have here. First of all, just a little historical note. Some of your Bibles, if you're reading in your own Bible, or if you read this later, you'll notice there's a, a note or a brackets or a, a, a footnote that says that the earliest manuscripts of the Gospel of John do not contain this story. 
And so you might be wondering, well, if that's the case, why is it in there? Because most conservative New Testament scholars unanimously agree that even though we don't know exactly where to place it, it's authentic to the Gospels. D.A. Carson says, although we are not unanimous about where to place this account in the Gospels, we are unanimously convinced of its authenticity. So Jesus has been teaching in the temple the day before, and he's stirred up the people. They're excited. He's this caused quite a buzz, and he's irritated and ticked off the religious leaders. He goes away that night and spends most of the night praying on the Mount of Olives, which is just outside the city. The next day he comes back into the temple, and this time the religious leaders are ready for him to trap him. They don't like Jesus too much. They don't think he's who he claims to be, the Messiah at all, and they want to do away with him. Now, this is where the story gets really, really interesting if you're paying attention. They drag a woman in front of Jesus in the temple courts, open air, massive courtyard, big open platform, people all around. They drag this woman, how humiliating, in front of Jesus. The whole thing is designed to be a setup and a trap to find some way to discredit Jesus. So I want to, the first thing is an impossible dilemma. They're trying to catch him in, in in an impossible no-win situation. Adultery was a very serious offense in Jewish law and culture. It, it, it could be a little more different today. Uh, adultery is one of the Ten Commandments. It's, con- it's connected to our spiritual betrayal of idolatry, and it was a capital offense. Leviticus 20 said, by the law of, of Moses, we, you could stone an adulterer to death. So on the one hand, if Jesus says not to stone her, he could be accused of ignoring and violating the very Old Testament law he said he came to fulfill. On the other hand, if he says to the Jewish leaders, well, go ahead with the stoning, the people who loved his teaching would instantly think, well, this guy's no different. I mean, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden and burdened, for I will execute you. It doesn't sound so nice. And, and besides, he's, he could be arrested for breaking Roman civil law because if he's giving the order, only Rome had the right to execute a person to have them killed. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the religious leaders, they think they have him on this one. They think they've got him trapped. And they do this on their own turf, which is, it's, first of all, it's not a good idea to try to trap Jesus. I think we see that in the gospel. Second of all, it's all his turf, so you don't have any good place to do this. Before we go to his response, a couple of things to point out. First, how do religious leaders catch someone in the act of adultery? Hmm. In the act, I won't describe it, but in the act, they catch her. How did they know? And presumably it wasn't just two minutes ago when they dragged her up there. They've had her overnight. If they're so concerned about the law, why didn't they deal with her when they caught her? Why wait till morning? Something's going on here. Second, adultery is rather difficult to do alone. So if she was caught in the act, where's the guy? Where's the man? Just her? You only caught her? How does that work, religious leaders? And they drag her in front of Jesus. And he, of course, knows all this. This whole thing is a facade. Now, this woman was an adulteress. We'll see, get to that later. But she's also being used as a pawn in a great religious and political struggle going on here. Because of their total confidence in their victory, the Pharisees planned this to take place on their own turf. <laughs> they have no idea what Jesus is going to do. The question facing Jesus is one that we all have to deal with in some way or another, not that scenario, but here's the question. Morality or mercy? Morality or mercy? Are we going to uphold the law or protect the person? Are we going to trample on God's standard or are we going to trample on the individual who who broke it? It's a dilemma. So how does Jesus respond? Well, an improbable solution. An impossible dilemma followed by an improbable solution. First thing Jesus does, and I love this part. I don't know why I just love it so much because it's a little strange. They, they have this woman here. They ask him the question. Everyone's waiting to hear what Jesus will say. And he bends down and he begins to write in the ground. What? What is he doing? Why is he doing that? He begins to write on the ground. What is he writing? Everyone wants to know. Some have speculated the names of the Pharisees. He's writing out their names. Bob, Bill, Joe, and Zechariah probably, you know, not those names. Was he writing specific sins they committed? Maybe he's writing a list of the things that they're thinking. Maybe he's writing out, maybe just doodling, drawing little pictures and buying time, which is what I would have been doing. Uh, I'm just going <laughs> to draw the dirt till I think of something to say. I think he was probably writing part of the Old Testament law. 
In fact, I've been personally reading through Jeremiah in my morning devotions, and if you're tracking along with the videos, you see this. Jeremiah 17, 13 says, those who turn away from you, their names will be written in the earth. Maybe he wrote Jeremiah 17, 13. The truth is, we're not told what he wrote. But it must not be crucial for us to know. What it does tell us is that Jesus is totally unfazed by this whole thing. He's not rattled. He sees what's going on. Notice a couple of things. Jesus does not say the woman is innocent. He never says she's innocent. He does not say that capital punishment is unethical. He does not deny the Old Testament law at all. In fact, he absolutely honors the law. He honors the law far more than those who are trying to trap him in it. He goes right back then to writing the dirt after he says this remarkable thing. He looks at the leaders while he's bent down drawing, and he says, okay, you who's without sin, those of you who are sinless, you cast the first stone. You're right. If she's an adulteress, you're right. Go ahead. Be the first executor. And he goes, then he squats down and goes right back to writing again, which is just so cool. And one by one, these leaders drop their stones and walk away. The text says, beginning with the oldest ones first, which is interesting. It's a patriarchal society, which means the elders are the ones that everyone looks to for the example. The oldest ones are the first to recognize we shouldn't be here. We have nothing on this guy. They drop their stones and they walk away. Amazing. Now the whole scene has shifted, hasn't it? From the dilemma, mercy and morality, to Jesus has totally turned it around. And finally, it's just Jesus riding in the dirt and this woman standing all alone. Just the two of them. It's hard to imagine the emotions. He stands up, the Bible says. He turns to her and he says, woman, where are they? Who's the they? He says, you're condemners. Where are those ones who brought you here as the great sinner to be condemned? Where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she says, probably through tears in her eyes, no one, sir. And then Jesus says something that I, I, I get emotional every time I read it. Neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. Romans chapter 8, verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. No condemnation. Let me say that again in case you weren't listening. No condemnation. How much condemnation? None. None. Jesus looks at her, and she's, she's, he's, she's not innocent. And he says, neither do I condemn you. What must that have felt like to her? Have you ever felt that? Have you ever heard Jesus say to you, neither do I condemn you? We condemn ourselves. 1 John 3 tells us, when our hearts condemn us, he is greater than our hearts. We condemn ourselves all the time. We walk around with shame and guilt weighed down. Others condemn us all the time. But Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. He treats her as a person with dignity. You know, there's an irony here. The Pharisees brought this woman to Jesus to, to trap him and have her executed. But they unwittingly bring her to the only one who can save her, physically and spiritually. They exposed her sin and brought her to Jesus, precisely what she needed and what I need and what you need. And Jesus does not dismiss her sin. That's very important that you hear. If it just fig ended with neither do I condemn you, go about your life, do as you please, that it wouldn't be Jesus. He says, now that you know the free gift of grace offered to you and who I am, now that you know there's no condemnation, now go and sin no more. Now go leave your life of sin. That is so important. The woman is this recipient of an unexpected act of sacrificial love from the only one who could, justify her, or who could justifiably execute her. Think about it. When it's just her and Jesus, she should be more terrified because he's the only truly sinless one. Remember Jesus' question? You without sin, throw the first stone. The only sinless one in that whole courtyard is Jesus. And now it's just her and him. And yet he, the only one in the universe who has the right to condemn, doesn't. Because that's who he is. 
but it's the grace and the mercy that leads her to go and sin no more. Friends, I think this is so much better than saying love the sinner, hate the sin. In fact, what we ought to be saying is love your neighbor and hate your own sin. I've got enough sin in my life to deal with without hating all of yours. Hate my own sin, deal with my own sin. Let Jesus forgive and and speak to and help me work out and leave my own sin. That does not mean we don't hate evil in the world and care about injustice and work for God's kingdom. Of course we do. But when it comes to how we interact with individual people, I think this is our model. Neither do I condemn you. Now let me introduce you to Jesus. Let me introduce you to the only one who can forgive, who can redeem, who can lead you into a whole new kind of life. And what better way for us to celebrate this to remember this, to reflect on this, and to experience this grace than by coming to his table, than by finishing with communion. Jesus here, before he goes to the cross, is saying to the woman, neither do I condemn you. But the way that we know there's no condemnation, how could God hate sin and those who continue in sin and still love people with great grace and mercy? There's only one way, at the cross, that's how. That's where you see the perfect justice and mercy of God coming together. And he's given us one central act by which we remember the place where his justice and mercy meet for us and for our salvation at his table through bread and cup. So I'm going to pray and Anton's going to sing a couple of uh, portions of this, the great hymn you'll all know, Amazing Grace, because it is amazing, friends. It's amazing, his grace. It's amazing to this woman in this ancient story. It's amazing in my life. It's amazing in your life if you know it. We'll sing this together and then I'll come back up and lead us through taking bread and cup. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we deserve condemnation. We are sinful. And yet you look at us with love in your eyes and say, as you said to that woman, neither do I condemn you. But you don't just leave us there, God. You call us then to walk with you by your grace, to leave our sinful thoughts and behaviors behind. And we know this is true because you've told us You've demonstrated your love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, you died for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Prepare our hearts now as we come to your table to celebrate your amazing grace.